could they possibly be doing in there? Hello? There's people in line here. Can you hurry it up, please? When they get out of there, I'm gonna have a word with them. As long as I don't pee my pants first. Oh my god. Please let me in. Hello? Ugh. Oh my goodness. Finally. Do you know how long I've been what? It's you. Hey. Why were you in there so long? Are you sick or something? Yeah. Oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear that, but I can't talk right now. I have to go to the bathroom. What's up everyone? Starting today off with a question. Have any of you had to wait like that before? Like maybe you're waiting in line for the bathroom or waiting for that new game to come out or waiting to see what you got on that test or if you made the team, got the part or waiting for Thanksgiving break to get here so you can finally have a few days off of school. Like, have you ever anxiously waited for something before? I remember in middle school, I had this crush on this girl then, so I decided that the best course of action would be to write her a note asking her out. I mean, it was too classic, like check a box, yes, no, or maybe style, and, and I wrote a note because talking to girls was scary even back then. And so I had one of her friends give it to her during their next class, and then the class after that I had with this girl, so then I'd be able to see what she was feeling, like yes, no, or maybe. And, and I remember the class before was just agonizing, like just watching the clock and it could not have been clicking slower. But eventually the bell rang and seventh grade Jeff could not be more excited. Like I'd been anxiously waiting to see what she was going to say for about an hour now and, and it was time. I was still playing it cool though, like I didn't want to be the first one in class just sitting there and like an eager beaver just waiting like, so what you think, like did you check a box? You checked yes, you'd probably check yes, didn't you? And so I'm just about to walk into the class, my heart is beating really fast and, and the wait is about to be over and I walk in and there's just this group of people standing around her and they all just in unison look right at me and then begin to start laughing together. And so, yeah, that was fun. It didn't take me long to learn that she could not have checked no harder. And so my anxious waiting quickly turned into a different kind of anxiety, but you know what, that's okay. Like at least I didn't have to wonder anymore. Like the waiting, the anticipation, that was all over, which was just a good feeling, I guess, right? Because waiting, it's never fun, right? I mean, sometimes waiting, it can be filled with excitement and anticipation, but I think that most people would agree that if they had the choice, they just skip right ahead to the end, like to the other side of waiting. Because no matter how exciting waiting is, the things we're waiting for, it's usually better, or at least it's better known than just sitting in that tension forever. And I'm sure that's a lot of how a lot of people felt in the Old Testament as they awaited the promised savior. There's story after story of waiting and patience and also God coming through and fulfilling his promises. Like as they continued to bring their sacrifices to God, there was an anticipation for the ultimate sacrifice and king. And it's something that we can see so clearly in Isaiah 53, which is a prophetic message anticipating Christ written 700 years before Christ was born. And I just want to take some time and read it for you. If you have your Bible or you have it with you on your phone, feel free to follow along Isaiah 53, but here it is. Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum, but the fact is it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything that we've done wrong, on him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried and he was let off. 
And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he'd never heard a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, he will make many righteous ones, as he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I will reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch, because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. And I don't know, just imagine having to wait hundreds and hundreds of years for this good news. Like at, at what point do you start asking questions like, is God really gonna come through? How long are we going to have to wait? And maybe you're in a period of waiting right now and you're asking some of those questions, but the good news for us is that we can turn the pages and see that a baby was born and throughout his life, he fulfilled God's promises to us. Like through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God's plan was finally fulfilled. And because of that, we can know and experience eternal life because while we were still sinners, like while we rejected God and spat in his face, Christ died for us and he turned us from rejectors into friends. Like when God sent Jesus, it proved that God is for us and always has been for us. Like God had always been faithful, but this was the ultimate fulfillment. And his way of saying like, I am so for you that I would die for you. Like I'll be there for you even when you're not for me. Like I've been for you since before you were even born. I'm for you now and I'll always be for you. And now God could have come up with any plan to show that he loves us, but this is the plan that he showed. Like he laid down his life for us. And in becoming a sacrifice for us, Jesus proves that God is for us. And I just can't help but think, like as we close out this series, us for them, just as we've talked about being for our enemies and for the people around us, like how important it is for us to realize that God is for us. And he proved it by putting his life on the line. And I think about how easy it is to get caught up in the frustration of waiting, like in the frustration of unanswered questions, in the frustration of not having the control that we so often want, and just how easy it is to blame God in the frustration. Like I think of how many times I've blamed God after just 15 minutes of waiting, let alone thousands of years. Like I think how frustrated I've gotten because I don't always have every answer to every question. I think about how selfish I've been challenging God's plans because I think I have a better way. But then I pause. And, and I just remember the joy that I have knowing that Christ died for me. Like in spite of all of the areas where I fall short, I look back on my life and I see how God has not once broken a promise. I look back at all of the times that I was frustrated at God, like the times that I rejected God and I put a hand up to him and the times early on in my life where I just questioned if he was even there. And I see how he was working in and, and putting people around me in that waiting. Like that he has never let me down. And he has worked things together for good. And was it in my timing? Almost never. Was it better that it wasn't? Absolutely. Like listen, I, I wanna close this series by saying this, we are never going to have it all figured out. But what we do have figured out is that Christ lived, died, and rose again to prove once and for all that the God who created us is 100% on our team. And I, I don't know about you, but that is something that just fires me up and is what makes it so much easier for me to be for others. And so if you're in that frustrated period, period of waiting, like, I just want to challenge you to ask yourself honestly, like whether you think you're in that period because God hasn't kept his promise or if you've impatiently put a hand up to God. Like that is a question that I have to ask myself years ago, I had to process through it and it was along that process of waiting and, and in time's frustration that I found Jesus, that, that I met the savior of my life who has absolutely transformed me in that waiting and I have never looked back. Say hi. Hi. Uh, Say bye bye to the ball. Bye bye ball. Okay. Mommy's uh, gonna hold. 
cake. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Hey, where's your belly button? Where's your belly button? <laughs> Can you say hi? Hey Maisie. Hey Maisie, come here. Hey Maisie, can you blow me a kiss?